Hello and welcome to this new WASP Top 10 episode. Today, you will learn why using components with known vulnerabilities is so bad, how you can exploit it, and what you can do to prevent it. So far, we've seen how you can write secure code which doesn't expose your assets to security vulnerabilities. However, you might write 100% secure code and still be vulnerable. How is that possible? Well, through the usage of vulnerable components. The plan will be as follows. We will explore how developers might unintentionally be using components with known vulnerabilities. And from there, we will explore how to detect and exploit vulnerable components. Then we will practice on examples in OWASP WebGoat and Juice Shop. Also, we will discover some real-world attacks leveraging insecure components. And finally, we will explore how you can mitigate this issue and some tools to help you along the way. Unless you are writing a really simple function which doesn't do much, you will reuse software of other people. From development to deployment, you will use libraries, frameworks and technologies, etc. And guess what? Those third-party components will also depend on other components. This comes at a cost. In fact, part of the third-party software components you will reuse will suffer from security vulnerabilities. Besides, you might even be using some malicious components. Therefore, checking your code is a need, not a luxury. Let's first understand how attackers find and exploit vulnerable components. When you hunt for assets which use components with known vulnerabilities, the first step is to fingerprint the technologies. During this step, you should gather the names and versions of technologies which the application uses. You can use many techniques. Usually, the HTTP traffic contains hints like names of cookies, HTTP headers, title values and links, etc. However, you might not recognize most of them. Therefore, you can use tools to assist you. For example, the Wappalyzer browser extension fingerprints the technologies based on elements of the HTML page and HTTP headers. Sometimes you can trigger verbose errors which give you a hint on the technologies being used. This is where fuzzing is handy. For example, you can remove expected parameters, send unexpected values, etc. If you receive an error, it usually contains some hints about the stack. You can directly access known directories using some publicly available dictionaries to look for typical login portals, readme files, etc., which might contain the name and the version of the components being used. Better yet, if you find files like package.json or bower.json, you will have access to the list of all libraries and versions. If you have access to the source code, don't hesitate to collect the dependencies. You will have a full visibility of the components being used. Now, the second step involves looking for CVEs and exploiting them. If you are lucky, you might find CVEs with public exploits on multiple online resources, such as ExploitDB for public exploits, SNCC for open source libraries, and CVE databases for vulnerabilities which have been reported. From there, you can either directly use the public exploits or try to exploit the CVE yourself. As a side note, never blindly execute public exploits without first understanding what they do. Sometimes they contain malicious code which will exploit your machine. I highly recommend you follow along with these exercises on your own machine. If you don't have one, feel free to download the one I prepared for this course. You should have it pop up somewhere on the top. In this section, we will see how both vulnerable and malicious libraries can affect the security of your own code. For instance, OWASP WebGoat uses a vulnerable version of the CrossStream library to transform an XML document into a Java object. In the palm.xml file, you can see that the library's version is 1.4.5. Looking for public exploits on the internet reveals that this version suffers from a severe deserialization vulnerability, which leads to remote code execution. The release version, which is used in the OWASP lab provided as part of this training, doesn't include the vulnerable version of the cross-stream library. Therefore, we will spin up a Docker container based on the latest WebGoat version, which contains the vulnerable cross-stream library. We will register a new user, 
because this is a brand new application and we will connect to the Docker container using the exec command. Let's take the ID of the container and run bin bash. Now we have a shell on the Docker container. We list the temp directory and we verify that there is no file named here. Let's go to our challenge under vulnerable components challenge 12 and let's paste our payload. We will add our command touch slash dump slash here. When you hit go, you can see that when you run ls command on the Docker container, the file here was created. Sometimes developers might reuse a rogue component which resembles to the legitimate one. This is known as typo squatting. It is a scary thing, especially when the malicious library is widely used by other projects. For instance, this GitHub issue reports how the attacker has been exfiltrating SSH keys and internal files using a rogue module, which he had named python 3 dateutil This name was not randomly chosen. In fact, the legitimate module name is python dateutil Unfortunately, few hundred people fell for it. OWASP juice shop is using a fake library. Let's get the package.json backup file using the technique we've discovered earlier. From there, you can see the list of all the dependencies that Juice Shop is using. One of them pops out, which is epilogue-js. If you look it up, you can find that this is just a module for demonstration purposes, and it is meant to be masquerading the legitimate library, which is called epilogue. In this section, we will explore some real-world attacks which leverage vulnerable components. Probably the most famous manifestation of this issue would be the Equifax breach. In fact, the entry point exploited a vulnerable version of struts to gain remote code execution and pivot inside the Equifax network and steal more than 140 million customers' personal information. In this demo write-up, the attacker demonstrates how he was able to develop exploits against a vulnerable WordPress plugin when no public exploits were available. He exploited a SQL injection, a CSERV, and any cross-site scripting vulnerability. This is a demonstration of how you can use CVEs to write your own exploit. You also have this report, which demonstrates how the hacker was able to exploit a cross-site scripting vulnerability due to a vulnerable version of the tiny MCE library. As a side note for bug hunters, note how a valid proof of concept can greatly impact the quality and the reward of the report. To prevent this issue, the ideal solution would be to never trust third-party components unless you are sure of their safety. Unfortunately, this is easier said than done. In fact, it is not realistic to manually verify all the libraries you are using in your code. In this article, Sneak explains how a library was caught stealing bitcoins. I recommend you read it, but here is the takeaway. The widely used event stream package contained a malicious package named flatmap-stream. The event stream package was not actively maintained. This is the criteria you should take into consideration. You should prefer components with a healthy community. Mitigating the risk would simply involve removing the rogue library. However, this is not scalable due to the considerable number of components you are using. Therefore, you should constantly and automatically monitor your dependencies. SNCC provides this feature, but in general, you must have a dependency checking process for all your projects. For example, OWASP provides this dependency checker for Java projects. Additionally, you should implement the following. Have a patch management process which helps you detect and patch vulnerable components using public CVE databases, but additionally, you should apply some behavioral analysis to spot any unusual activity. For instance, any server initiating requests to external servers should be inspected. You can use tools such as Rita for this purpose. There are many more details on the Hackerish blog. I recommend you read the blog post there and practice what you learn. You can download the virtual machine I prepared for this course and start practicing right away. And that was it! I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. If you're not subscribed yet, hit the subscribe button and enable notifications so that you know when a new video is up. Until then, stay curious, 
learn new things and go find some bugs.